So um, I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, typical type typos. I will explain uh, shortly. Uh, this talk was uh, given in uh, ACCU um, this year, which was uh, a remote event, um, online event. Um, and um, it's, it's probably the same, uh, the, the video is out there, but um, it's an interactive uh, session. So seeing the video is one thing, and answering the questions in the uh, session itself is another thing. So I'm glad you're here. Um, if somebody already saw the video, so let's see if you remember um, the answers. Some of the questions are pretty easy, not all of them. So let's go on. Let's talk about typical type typos. Um, I, I will start with uh, just the disclaimer. Uh, the talk is being recorded, so if uh, you are unmuted, uh, your voice would be recorded um, and might be also your video if it is open uh, and your initials or name. So you're welcome, but just know that. Uh, a few words about myself. I'm a lecturer at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo and Tel Aviv University, a uh, member of the Israeli ISO uh, Signals Plus National Body. Uh, the co-organizer of the CoCPT conference and uh, meetup group, which you are here uh, now, and proudly and happily just recently joined uh, Incredibuild as a developer advocate for C++. Uh, previously, I was uh, in the industry in many uh, roles. Uh, one of them was the chief programmer at Converse. Um, uh, one uh, slide on, on uh, Incredibuild. If you are suffering from slow builds, it's not just a waste of time. It affects your development cycles and productivity. So slow builds is a real issue with C++. And Incredibuild is one of the best solutions for that. So I uh, urge you to talk with me or uh, any other representative from uh, Incredibuild on the subject. Typical type typos. I'm going to speak about common errors that relate to bad use or implementation of types. Uh, this relates either to bad design, inefficiency, undefined behavior, just pure bugs, or compilation errors. Uh, I must say that um, being a teacher, being a lecturer, I do uh, see quite a lot of bugs. But those bugs that I see with uh, uh, the code of juniors, uh, students, they bring the same bugs to the industry later on. So it's not only bugs that students write. Uh, we'll see here things that we will take a look at, and we'll see it looks OK, or maybe not. Uh, bugs do tend to hide themselves. So uh, I do see a lot of bugs. Let's meet some of them. Um, just before we start, let's uh, remember that uh, compiler warnings come before anything. If you have a warning, just go and, and fix it. So um, before you say, hey, uh, the code review says something, wait. You have warnings that you have to look at. Static code analysis tools, use them. And best practices. Best practices are tools to avoid uh, performance issues, bugs. So if you follow best practices, you would avoid some of the issues. And there are links here for all of these. Uh, also, before we start, some of the slides are uh, marked with a skip uh, image, which means that we might not have enough time to uh, go this uh, through this slide, so don't feel that we are rushing. It was pre-planned. Um, and last note before we start, it is a game, and there is a prize. So you're requested to count your points. We rely on your um, accountability, but you must submit your answer before my answer is revealed in order to count your answer if it is correct. And uh, my answer would be considered right even if you disagree. So you're going to count your points, and the uh, prize would be a nice, incredible t shirt that would be sent to the winners uh, once they will send me an email with their home address or office address anywhere in the world which have some post delivery. Um, so let's go. Uh, let's try it. Don't count this one. This is not an actual question in the contest, but let's warm up. OK, we have this code. In the main, we initialize the variable i. 
and don't count this one, uh, but the question is, what do we see here? What's the value of i after uh, we run the line in main? Uh, and there are four answers. You have to um, submit your answer in the poll. And the answers are A, it is undefined behavior due to bad initialization. B, the same, but uh, one of them is for Americans, the other one is for Brits, the other one is. So the poll here, in fact, is checking whether you are American or British or um, anywhere in the middle. Um, I think that we can. And the poll and present the results in two, three seconds, and here, here it comes. Thank you, Bali. Bali is helping me here with the poll. Um, so I think most of you prefer the American uh, way of writing that. Yeah, I think. Okay. Uh, but as we said, there is no real actual right answer here. Anyway, it's undefined behavior, this one. Okay, so we are ready, I think, to start. Let's go. Uh, this is the first one. What's wrong in the code here? Probably some of you know that. Probably some of you look at that and say, yeah, we know. The problem is clear. The answers are, in the line that is marked with the arrow, there is a dangling pointer or inefficiency. If the answers uh, just, you know, uh, block the uh, correct, uh, the, the poll, you can move the poll aside and then see the answers and then cast your vote. So dangling pointer or inefficiency or a potential leak or compilation error. Please cast your vote. We have here a loop um, on some stood map. Uh, we get back pair by ref. And the answer is, do we have your dangling pointer inefficiency, um, compilation error, or potential leak? What do you say? Let give, let's, let's give you uh, three more seconds. And I um, just uh, remember you that you can count your vote only if you do vote. Okay? You cannot say, I didn't vote, but I meant that. If you vote, you can count if it is the correct answer, or at least the answer that I mark is correct. So. Let's see the results. Uh, most of you say B, and that's correct, indeed. What is the inefficiency here? Do you see the inefficiency? Well, we have here a lot of redundant copies. We have redundant copies for creating the value, redundant copies for creating the key, and redundant copies for creating the pair, holding the key and the value. But why? We do get it by ref. Well, the reason is that um, when you get a const pair of key and value, this is not the same type that was brought, that was passed from the loop. The actual type was a pair of const key and value. So the compiler hesitated. The compiler thought maybe he should issue a compilation error. But then the compiler remembers that, well, I can cast it. I can create a new const reference because a const reference can be binded to an R value. So I would create a new pair holding a new key, which is fine because once you have a new key, you can drop top level const. It's okay, it's by value, and a copy of the value. Actually, this is what happens. And you do want to avoid, uh, when, I, when I show this one, in some cases, people go to their code base, do some grabs, and see that they do have such mistakes. You write in C++ in order to have efficiency. Um, you run the reference, and you create copies. And our value or const reference is very open for redundant copies. Uh, by the way, if you would run here without the const, just the reference, this would be compilation error because a reference, L value reference, cannot be binded to uh, our value. Uh, but const reference can. Uh, the, the, of course, you can write const key, and if you add the const here, then you would not have the temporaries. Or the better solution is to use outer. And I think if you um, are about use outer everywhere, probably you saw this example. Okay, um, even nicer. You could have used structured binding if you want. Yeah, that's nice. It's not a must, 
but you do, you could do that. Um, related to that are some uh, links. Uh, you will have eventually the slides, uh, so you could go through the links later on. What's wrong here? We are on the second uh, poll. In about wait with the poll team. Oh, uh, okay. People can uh, put it a bit aside in order to see the actual answers. And the question is, uh, we have almost the same uh, function, but here we do run on OutRef. And the question is, what's wrong with the signature of the function? We get a std map of k value, and the answers are, we have a const issue. We should use folding reference somewhere. Uh, this is not generic enough, or we have some kind of bad style. What is the problem with the signature of this function? Do you have your const issues? Hey, or should we use folding reference somewhere, maybe on the parameters that we get? Um, do we have your problem by being non generic enough, or is it some, is, is it some kind of uh, bad style? Okay, let's give you uh, uh, three more seconds and we can share the results. Uh, most of you, most of you say C. And what is not generic enough here? What is the problem? Well, the problem is that the current method is a bit narrowing, is a bit strict. It only gets a certain map. It even doesn't get any kind of map that you want, even though it is templated. Why? Because map has a third template parameter. So if, for example, you have a map using a greater function object, then this map couldn't go into print. Why? Because it's not the same map. It's not the same type. The default comparator, the default third template parameter is stood less. So we didn't say anything about the third template parameter, so we actually allow here only certain kind of student map. Okay, what's a better approach? Well, well a better approach might be... I have, question, yeah, I have a comment or a question. The diff in the previous example, that was a performance hit that you don't see. In this case, if you ever use that print with the stood greater, it will just fail to compile. So that's correct. It's in, not, in this example, it's a very different type of error. Error. That's correct. very different type of error. But it would be an nasty one. And, and, and since not everybody would understand the nasty error message that you will get, um, some people would just say, okay, so I will just send my std map to another method, or I will just implement another one, or I don't know why, or, or, or anything else. But yeah, you would get compilation error, however, it might be uh, a bit nasty. So um, the solution might be to say, okay, we have additional uh, template parameters supporting any kind of std map. I uh, uh, recall that you have also an allocator at the end. Um, we could even uh, make it a bit more generic by saying, okay, I uh, support any kind of a mapping uh, associative container, given that this associative container has a key, a value, and maybe some additional arcs. But then when you take a look at this solution, which is quite generic, there is still a problem here. What is the problem? This is not a quest here. You just need to think about it. You will not have a poll. What's the problem here? Well, we have a template template parameter, which says I have a template parameter called map, which is templated over at least two template parameters and maybe additional ones. Well, the problem is it's too greedy. It's too greedy, this one. It takes too many options which do not want to get inside. Anything that is templated over two template parameters may try to go in, even if, if it is not an associative container. Nothing here says that we are exp accepting, expecting an associative container. So uh, maybe it's better to use some kind of uh, concept, maybe, to narrow that, or a spinner. So we could that, do that. OK, let's go for the next one in Val. Please wait till we see the answers and people uh, think a moment. So. This one here is a print pair method. And the print pair method is getting a const outer. But the question is not about it is maybe it is too greedy. Well, it is a bit too greedy. On the other end, it is called print pair. 
So, well, the, the name says something which means, yeah, call me with a pair. But it is too bitty. But this is not the question. The question is, what is the problem with this line? And the options are, we have here a dangling pointer or inefficiency or a potential leak or a bad design. What do you say? And again, the question is on the printing itself, the line of the C out. Okay, uh, again, dangling pointer, maybe in some cases, inefficiency, potential leak, or a bad design. We'll give you, I see that you are a bit more speedy now. Uh, we'll give you three more seconds. Okay, and I think that we can share the results. Most of you say, say D. Okay, and in fact, this is also what I think. There is some kind of bad design here. Uh, in fact, in more than one layer, in, in more than one aspect. Uh, the first thing is that it is a language issue. It is a language accident that the language decided to have first and second as a members. It should have been functions. Why? Because once it is a member, it is much harder to come with your own pair that has a different behavior. Like, for example, maybe the second is calculated lazily. Well, it is doable, but with a proxy class. It would be much easier if first and second would be methods. Well, this is something with the language itself. But, well, this is pair. What's the problem with my code? Well, the problem with your code is that, you know, auto, it is quite too generic, but let's, in a way, use it. It might be that we get here something which is kind of a pair, but is not a pair. What can we get which is, well, a pair, even though it is not stood pair? A tuple of two. And once a tuple of two goes in, this would not compile. So if you are generic, um, getting const out or f, maybe better to use std get, which works both for std pair and std tuple and std array. This would be more generic. You would use the option of getting other possibilities. This would be better, I think. Okay, uh, maybe even better. Maybe I can narrow it with some kind of a concept. This is C++ 20 concept. For example, the concept can be, I require P to be of a tuple size value of two, which works fine with stood pair, stood tuple, and stood array. All three do obey this. Then I do want to have get zero and get one working for this type. Once this is my requirement, I can get in only something which is actually a pair. That's generic, but on the other end, restricting only the actual types that I wish to get. Okay, let's go for the next one. I have a method call, called zero initialize all. And zero initialize all gets an outer ref of a container, some kind of a container. And again, this is quite generic, maybe too generic, but you know, you have the name of the method, it says zero initialize all. So you are expected to send me a container. I'm running on the container, and then I'm zero initializing each value in the container. And the question is, What's wrong here? Maybe the thing that is wrong is that you should have auto double ref for the first auto on the first auto. Or maybe you should have auto double ref on the second auto. Or maybe the second auto should be by value. Or maybe the first value auto. First auto should be by value. And now it's the time to cast your vote. Something is not working here correctly in some of the cases. Might be this, this, this code would not be functioning. I have to fix something in order to make it more usable for a specific case. What is the required fix? And I should say that you can guess. It's okay to guess. If you're guessed and you guess the correct answer, it means that you have good intuitions and that's fine. You can count this answer. So please guess. Okay, we'll give you three more seconds and then we will reveal your votes. 
Okay, most of you say that the second auto should be double ref. Why? Why it is needed for the second auto to be double ref? Well, what does it mean being double ref? Does it mean being an R value? No, it means being a folding reference. Double ref on an auto means being a folding reference. Why do I want to add folding reference? Well, because there is a very special language accident called Vector of Bulls, with a, which has also a blog called Vector of Bulls. Uh, it is a known language accident, but it is out there. And if you want this code to work, to work also for Vector of Booleans, Vector of Bulls, you need to get the value as a folding reference, which would be able to either get an L value or an R value. Why? Because when you run on a vector of booleans, you get your a proxy class, a proxy, proxy object, which represents the bit inside the vector of booleans. It would not work for vector of booleans if you would not use the double ref here, which means folding reference. It's quite a corner, but you know, the language is full of corners. Beware of specialization. It was a language accident. You know that the um, um, list of substitution principle can be rephrased for templates, saying one should be able to use the specialized version, the same as using the base template without being aware of the exact type being used. Well, it, is, it was not said for templates. It was phrased for polymorphism, but the same thing should work also, also for specialization. And for vector booleans, it does not hold. But you should, in a way, if you know that, write your code so it can accommodate vector booleans, if you can. OK. Uh, if we were talking about BA, beware of specialization. So let's take a look at another specialization using inheritance, both specialization and inheritance in the same example. OK, we have here a struct foo uh, with a function called print. We have pet and we have dog which inherit from pet. The specialized version of foo is specialized for pet. And the question is, if we call foo of dog, would we go to foo of pet or we would go to the base template? What, should, what would be printed in this example? We call foo of dog. We did specialized foo for a pet. And dog is kind of a pet. So should we see something, pet, dog, or do we have here some pro, uh, compilation error in this example? Please cast your vote. I remember you that you can guess. If you're not sure, if you have two possible answers, guess. Just, you know, pick one. OK, let's give you two more seconds. And let's reveal the answers. Most of you say that you will see something. Why? Because the specialization doesn't work well with polymorphism. Specialization is something that works in compile time. And well, dog is not a pet. And pet is a pet. So yeah, it would print something. This is not the way to use specialization with inheritance. Don't mix these two. Uh, even if you go with pointers, it would, it would be the same. It's not that if you go to pointers or references, it would change. No, the same issue. Dog star is not a pet star. Well, dog star can, pet star can point to a dog star, but uh, for template specialization, it doesn't work. Okay, I'm not sure that you will, you will um, face this thing in your code, but if you do, um, just remember that one. Okay, let's go for another one. Let's put aside the specialization issues and ask something about this my class. Suppose that we have a class that holds only RAI objects, which means it holds only managed objects that manage their own lifetime. I do not have here any pointer that I allocate. I do not have here anything that requires a destructor. So the objects manage themselves. And I have a default empty constructor, and I implement my copy constructor. And other methods 
but no other construct or destructor. And the problem here is either we have a dangling reference somewhere in the code or inefficiency, a potential leak or compilation error. So suppose we have some members, all of them are managed objects. Uh, we do have an empty constructor and we do need so, for some kind of a static counter to have a copy constructor in order to, and we do copy in, in the copy constructor. What's the problem? Dangling reference, inefficiency, potential leak, or compilation error. Uh, and you can cast your vote now. Let's give you 10 more seconds. 10 more seconds to take a look at the code. We have your simple class, no allocations. What's wrong here? Five more seconds. This is the time to pass your vote. And let's reveal the results. Well, there is a tie here between B and C. Either inefficiency, you say, or a potential leak. And the actual answer is inefficiency. Where does the inefficiency hide itself? Well, we do not have here the default move operations. And once we do not have the default move operations, then we do not go through member-wise move on our members. You must, in this case, declare your, your um, move constructor and move assignment as default. And there is a blog saying the rule of zero revisited, uh, the rule of all or nothing. Either you have nothing or you have all, which is some kind of saying, well, you did write here a copy constructor, which means that you waived the default move. Once you waive the default move, then when move is to be called on your type, it would not be called. You will go through the copy. And it will not go through the move of your members, which might be quite costly. Suppose that one of the members is a big vector or another container. So uh, remember the rule of zero. Do use default for your move if you need them. Uh, how do you do that right? Well, in fact, you have to maybe separate between the functionality that was required in the copy constructor and the other functionality of the class and maybe use your CRTP in order to get the counter right and only manage the, the fields here and not the counter and then you can do, and then you can use rule of zero. So if you see that you do not use rule of zero, even though you do not have any allocation or any resource management, it means something is not right with your class. Check if you can separate it into two or more different roles. Um, what's wrong here? We are on the next one. We have here a uh, move constructor. And suppose that inside the move constructor, we do anything that is required in the move constructor. Suppose even that if there is a need to initialize something in the initialize list, we do use the initialize list. So either we do use the initialize list if there is a need, or we do everything here if it is okay, and we do have a move constructor. So what's wrong here with this move constructor either? Um, this signature is adding some kind of a dangling reference. Well, the dangling reference is here for a lot of questions. Sometime at a certain point, it should come up. Maybe this is the point, or maybe we have your inefficiency, or do we miss a const here? Or maybe this is a, uh, we have your compilation error with this code. Please cast your vote. Do we miss here a const? Well, maybe we miss a const here. Uh, maybe there is a compilation error with this signature, or an angling reference might be hiding here, or some kind of inefficiency. Okay, let's give you five more seconds. Five more seconds. And I think that in, yeah, I think that we can reveal the votes. And you see that most of you say inefficiency, even though we have other answers as well. And the correct one is inefficiency. Where do we have here the inefficiency? Maybe someone wants to tell? Um, yeah, maybe I can answer. So we, we missed the no except on the move constructor. That's correct. That's exact. We move, uh, the move constructor is missing the no accept. And missing the no accept is a bad thing, is quite costly. By the way, I think that I saw a warning with one of the compilers on that, or maybe it was a static on analysis tool. But in most cases, I would say almost in all cases, move constructor and assignment and move assignment must use no accept because there is no real reason 
to throw an exception in your, in your move. And if you do not put the no except, then when a vector is being um, resized after a pushback, then the vector cannot move its uh, elements to the new position. It needs to copy. Why it needs to copy? Because um, when a vector is being enlarged, it has to allocate new, uh, uh, new position, new um, buffer, and then either to move or to copy all elements from the older allocation. And then um, free, the allocate the older allocation. Why should it use copy and not move? Because if the move is not so aimed, no, no except, it means that the move might throw. If the move might throw, it might be that we would move the first three elements, and then the fourth one would throw an exception. But then we are in a zombie scenario. Three elements moved, all the others didn't. We have here two parts of the vector in two different places. And we cannot go back. Because the way to go back is to call either copy, which might throw, or move, which may throw, as we know, for this move, if it doesn't say no except. So vector is not allowed to call move if it does, it does not have the no except signature. And it means that we will go through copy, which is quite costly. Don't forget the no except. And if you want to read about that, we have here some uh, links about the subject. OK, let's go for the next one. Oh, before the next one, before. Don't believe, you don't believe that? Well, there is here a link to Collier. Uh, and of course, the slides would be uh, available. And then you can press on the link see the code and see that, yeah, in, in one case, you call the move constructor. In the other case, you call the copy. And the only reason is that you forgot the no except. It actually has a difference. OK, uh, next one. There is a rule saying if you want to copy, pass by value. Why? Because if you pass by value, then there is an opti optimization that if this is an R value, we, do, we would not copy. We would just get the R value inside. And then we just move from it. If this is an L value, we copy and then we um, move from the copy. And um, the rule of if you want to copy paste by value is being used in many cases. What's wrong in this case? We are getting a string by value in order to sort it, in order to store it, sorry, in order to store it inside a set. So we get the string and we call insert. But we do move because we got it by value. What's wrong here? Uh, the dangling reference must come on sometime. Maybe this is its time. Or inefficiency, or potential leak, or maybe compilation at all. Please cast your vote. Do you see a um, case that might be a dangling reference, maybe? Or do you see here inefficiency? Or maybe we have here an issue with a potential leak, or compilation at all? Let's give you five more seconds, because I think that you got the idea and you are thinking quite fast now. Two more seconds, and here it is. Uh, well, most of you are saying inefficiency. Well, indeed, there is here inefficiency. Why? Because um, the rule of if you need to copy paste by value needs get great care. You can read about it. It relates in a way to uh, the copy and swap idiom, which is elegant but inefficient. Inefficient. There is a talk by Howard Innant in ACCU 2014 about the subject. So in some cases, something looks nice, but it is not actually really efficient. So you can go through these links to get explanations, but let's talk about this one, store. Well, we have uh, some alternatives. We have an alternative saying, well, let's implement two stores and overloading for store of a const L value reference and a store for R value. So with the R value, we would steal. And with the L value, we would just copy. Or another option is let's use folding reference. So with folding reference, we can say, we are getting a T, some generic T. And we are using here C plus or string T to require the T to be convertible to string because eventually we don't we want to store something which is convertible to string. 
And then we can insert it using std forward. These two options are more efficient than the previous one. If you want to see, you can run it. So I ran it with um, uh, the best optimization the, with O3, uh, both on libc++ and on libstd++. And the results are that if you pass L value, the option of getting a value would copy when it is not required to copy. All the other ones do not copy and do not move. If you pass R value, then the const reference option, if you have only a const reference, not both const ref and R value, only const ref, then you copy and you do not move. So if you want not to do anything with an L value, okay, and do something with move, uh, I, I forgot to say something very important here. The check here is when I call store with an exis existing item. Remember that this is a set. Eventually, when you call the set insert, it might be that the value that I'm sending to the set already exists in the set. So if it is, if it already exists in the set, then nothing should be happen. No, nothing should happen. So with L value, if you get by value, there is a copy and you do not want that. And the options that you do want is these two. These are better efficiency wise. Okay, let's go for the next one. What's wrong here? This is a very short piece of code. Person P is being initialized with Joan. What's wrong here? Maybe we have here a constructor which is not explicit or potential inefficiency or bad use of char star or a potential leak. What's wrong here? And we will give you some uh, less time now, I think, because it's quite a short piece of code. So in battle, please open the voting option and you can cast your vote now. And we'll give you five more seconds, five more seconds, four, three, two, one, and we're going to reveal the results. And most of you are saying that there is a problem here with the constructor being not explicit. And this is also what I think. Constructor should be explicit when you get parameter, which is not the full state of the object. Because then you avoid implicit casting, which may create bugs. You do not see the bug here, but you can get bugs where some string is being sent to a person instead of sending a person. You don't want that. A string is not a full state of a person. Well, with vector, you cannot do vec equals seven because it doesn't compile just justifiably because uh, the constructor is explicit. You must send the seven in parentheses. With string, you could do that. Why? Because we want to avoid the case of sending seven to a function getting a const vector f. So if the constructor is explicit, this would not work. But with string, the low is the full state of the object. So I'm not worried about the low being sent as a string. Yeah, low is some kind of string. This is the full state of the object. So what I'm saying usually is if the constructor is getting parameters which are not the full state of the object, make it explicit to avoid bugs like getting a, sending an argument which you didn't want to get and going through an implicit casting. Okay, um, I think we are ready for the next one. Are you getting on? Are you okay? Well, we have here a foo. Assume that there is a good reason we do not use here smart pointers. So not using smart pointers is not the answer here. Maybe we are implementing a smart pointer. Maybe there is a need for the pointer. So we have a pointer called PTR. And we have four functions. And the question is, what the problem with the code here? Well, either the code doesn't compile, or maybe PTR should be mutable. Or maybe code breaks logical const, or maybe code breaks physical const. What is the problem here? And let's reveal the results. Most of you are saying there is a problem, a problem with the logical constness. And indeed, this is the issue. Well, the first two lines compiles but are smelly. Why are they smelly? Because getting back a reference to an int 
compiles because the compiler is preserving the physical constants and the physical constants is on the pointer. I'm not getting back a pointer. Getting back a pointer by a reference here, the third one, wouldn't work for a const method. Const here would break. Const here. But getting back the actual int by ref would allow me to change the value inside PTR, the value that PTR points to, which is the logical const of this class. And adding a const method that at the end would allow me to change a value inside a member usually would confuse me, which usually is not what you want. So usually if it is a const method, make sure that nothing would change, even the content. And the content here is being preserved, being secured by the programmer and not the compiler. Uh, if you go with const on the second two, on those two, the compiler would notice because you cannot pass, you cannot return PTR by ref because PTR itself, the pointer, the compiler is worried about the pointer that you would change the address being held by the pointer. But the compiler is not um, concerned about the content and we are concerned. So do not put your const unless you add const at the beginning on the return value. This is just in a way bad style. So the answer was uh, the code breaks logical const. Okay. Um, we will skip about const iterators. You should um, uh, be concerned also about const iterators, do that right. You should use const small pointers correctly. In many cases, you put the const on a small pointer on the wrong place. Usually what you want is a shell PTR with a const content and not a shell PTR that cannot move with a non-const content. Usually the first one is the constness that you want. And in many cases, people do are, are confused and, and doing the second one. Um, and you remember probably that keeping const correctness is a good thing for two reasons. It widens the possible usage of a function and it protects us from indeliberate modifications. Remember also that there is const expression, but we'll not talk about that. And let's go for the next one. This is quite a complex, simple function. The function says, I want to get the, the, the function name is get or default. I want to get something or default, get or default. The function is templated over a map and a key. And I, I'm returning back the mapped type in the map, okay? The, the value that is being stored in the map. Um, you are sending me three parameters. The first one is the map, const ref. The second one is the key, const ref. And the last one is the default value, which means if you do not find the key in the map, please return me the default value. Otherwise, please return the value that you found in the map for the associated key that I sent. And the method is returning a const ref to the value, which is either the default value or the value that I found. What's wrong in this code? Either we have here a map that can be empty. Ooh, maybe this is a problem and we are not checking for that. Maybe we have here a dangling reference or inefficiency or code is too generic. What do you say? What do you think? Is it okay if the map being sent is empty? Maybe we have a dangling reference or in some cases might be that we would have a dangling reference. Maybe there is an inefficiency or maybe code is too generic. Let's give you five more seconds. Reminding you that you can just guess. Okay, so um, most of you are saying B, but uh, D is uh, not laying far behind. B is saying a dangling reference, and indeed this is my answer as well. Well, this example is, was introduced, was uh, presented in CppCon 2017 by Brandy Lewis from Facebook in his talk, Curiously Curing Facebook Bugs. And he said that in Facebook, they add some kind of function like that. And in some cases, people send the default value as an R value as just a const chop star. So we have here a default value, which is a temporary object. But when we send it back, when it, we return it, we return it as a const ref. 
Now the other side sees a const ref and instead of using it immediately, which would be fine, at the same line, at the same statement, it stores the actual return value in a reference. So we have here a return reference that you cannot actually store in a reference if you send me the value as an R value, because the R value would be dangling. So this is an actual bug that they had. Uh, what they did, uh, th this is the example. Suppose that you call get on default and you say, instead of copying the string, just give me the reference to the string because you know it's a string from the map. No, it's not the string from the map, it's, it's the pineapple. And the pineapple is an R value. And it is not being extended. The lifetime of an R value is being extended only if it is being created here. It was created in the function. It is not extended. The lifetime here is not extended. So we have here a const ref to a dangling to a dead pineapple. I don't know how, how it tastes. So uh, um, you would find it if you're using uh, ASIN, sanitize. Um, you can find it with static code analysis. You can fix it, OK? Uh, this is what they did. This is the link to YouTube. Um, what they did is they chose to return by value. Um, and then if you return by value, you have no uh, um, problem. And the question is, maybe there is a better choice. Can we keep it const ref and still be safe? Can we say, you know what? I'm returning you a const ref and don't worry, it would never be a dangling ref. How can I avoid a const ref being returned from the function from being a dangling ref? And still allowing you to either get an actual value from the map or the default value being sent. Of course, you would then get the default value as here as const ref, but maybe I can get back a const ref instead of by val and still keep it safe. Do you have an idea how to do that? Yep. Please go. I think to ref you're referring, I um, don't remember exactly how it's called, the uh, life extension for uh, returning const references. Um, well, I, I don't think that I can extend the life of the return value. If it was that's, temporary when it was sent, I cannot actually. That's, that's how uh, Alexandrescu implemented the original on scope exit two decades ago. Oh, what you mean is to use some kind of, instead of sending a default value as the map type, uh, to wrap it with some kind of a wrapper or a proxy. If a function returns a const reference, that uh, it, it has uh, its lifetime extended uh, until the end of the, the scope uh, the function is called from. But not for the next line. And the problem was with the next the scope, line. scope, the entire scope. The problem was that here, here, the next line is not the scope of the statement. So the, the pineapple might be used here. Here it is still alive because the statement holds it, but here it is not, and we got it as a const ref. So, well, the way that I suggest if here- you, if, you, if you have to return the default value, just in that case, you could uh, copy it, and then you would be returning a copy into a local value from the function, but it would, its lifetime would be extended. No, it would not. A local value from the function would not be extended. Uh, you can put it in a static variable, but then you have uh, thread issues. Um, there is an issue here, uh, an actual issue. So another, you can check it, but uh, the lifetime would not be extended for a local variable of the function, only for something that is being created on the same line. Uh, so perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps it's possible to follow, to make an overload with that accept default as R value? Yes, this is the answer. Uh, to come up with a one that returns by ref and another one which is deleted. Why it is deleted? Because it is getting, getting an R value, which means you cannot call this method with an R value for the default value. You want a default value? Create it one line before and then use it. And thus, it would not be an R value. Once it is not R value because we deleted this version, it is deleted or we can actually implement it. But then if we implement it, then we should return by value. And we prefer not to return by value. So we can delete it and say, if you want, please call us with the default value that you created 
a line before that's all so this is another option well, okay. why not just do that with a concept yeah i guess uh, you can do many things with concept I, I i actually i'm not sure that i see it but probably okay i'm going getting on to um our value shell ptr is back prone and this is also being presented in louis brandy uh, lecture it's a very good one go and watch it uh, i'm not going through this slide but it relates in a way to the same issue of dangling reference that are coming from a temporary or from a unique PTR being dead or shell PTR being dead. What's wrong in this one? We have three loops. The first one is looping over a string thus and getting back a char by value. The second one is looping over a string and getting back const char ref. And the third one is looking over the name of the person John being returned from a temporary object John. Okay, and the answers are all three loops may use a dangling reference, or B, A is okay, B and C may be using a dangling reference, or C, A and C are okay, but B may be using a dangling reference, or the last one, D, and B are okay, but C may be using a dangling reference. Confusing, right? Something is wrong here. All answers say that at least one option is using a dangling reference. Maybe more than one, maybe all three. Okay, let's give you 10 more seconds. Oh, oh, in Bal, you are quite quick. You don't leave enough time for people to think. That the fact that you solved it in five seconds doesn't mean that others can do the same. Okay, so uh, most of you are saying D and that's correct. That's correct, D, why D? Well, because, because the first two are extending the lifetime of the temporary inside the, the for each loop. The third one is extending, if there is a need, might be extending the return value of name. But the return value of name doesn't extend the lifetime of person John. Person John is not being held by the variable that we are looping on. So person John is just something that is not being extended. This is a problem. Don't write for each loops like that. And in fact, the, this problem is something, this is how it looks in the standard. It says, well, uh, I have uh, auto double ref and I get uh, uh, the string. This is when we are okay. But in some cases we are not okay. And there is a proposal to fix this behavior. There is a proposal recently came out to fix this proposal to fix this behavior. So for each loops would extend the lifetime of the entire um, statement of the entire of all actual objects that are being created. It would solve this problem, but it would not solve other problems where you have a temporary that was that uh, is being dead and and you still use it. So. It's just a proposal. It is still a dangling reference. Don't do that. Be aware. But but you're and assuming if, that name returns a reference. That's Something correct. Is... That's correct. If name, that's totally correct. If name returns by value, if name returns a copy, that's fine because the copy is created from the return value of name and then being held by range, and then you are fine. But if name returns by by ref which probably it does, and, and you actually cannot know. Maybe now it returns by value and then another programmer would uh, you know, change it to returning const ref, might be. So you cannot rely of, yeah, I have it a temporary, I, I hope things are right here. No, uh, if name is returning something that belongs to person and not copying it, well, you have your problem. And by the way, these kind of problems are not problems that you, see immediately. These kind of problems are problems that you say, well, it did run quite well. I did see John. I did loop over John correctly until you go to production and you have some other timing because you have your undefined behavior and undefined behavior is undefined. And in many cases, this kind of undefined behavior just works well. 
till a certain point, which is usually production. So don't write that. Okay, let's go for the next one. What's wrong in this case? Well, the story here is this story. We have a full method that is expe expecting a base ref, a const base ref, and we have some kind of for declaration for derived. Why don't we have here the actual derived? For some reason, the programmer add this code and derived is not here. It is not included. The code has only a forward declaration of derived. Can we have a function that gets derived by ref? Yes, we can, because forward declaration allows that. Can we do things with derive? Uh, not much. You cannot use incomplete type. So we are saying, you know what? Um, in a certain point in the code, the actual thing that we want to do is do something that you know, a base can do as well. So let's cast it back to a base ref. Well, that's bad code. But the question is, what can go wrong? Maybe the base is abstract, and this is the problem. Maybe we have here a runtime bad casting or compilation error or infinite recursion. What do you see here? Can I cast a derived back to the reference of the base? Is it safe? Can I do that? Well, there is no reason that you will see such things in actual code, but imagine what, you see anything. Okay, let's give you five more seconds. Two more seconds, and let's reveal the results. Most of you are saying B, runtime bad casting, and that's correct. The problem here is that we do not know that derived is actually derived from base. What we ask here the compiler to do is some kind of reinterpret, reinterpret casting, pointer casting, reference casting, without checking anything. And it might be that uh, derived would change in, at, at some point of time and would be derived not from base, but from base one. And anything else works, but not this casting. But the casting do compile. Uh, you don't want this casting to, to compile. Uh, or, or maybe we have uh, multiple inheritance and base is the second one. So the, the compiler needs to recalculate the actual pointer. Don't use C style casting. Instead of, instead of using C style casting, like for example, this one or other examples, don't use C style casting. But what can you do here? Either use static cast. Static cast is being checked at compile time, but static cast cannot be done on an incomplete type. But then you will realize that you cannot do that on the incomplete type. And then you will include derived. You will ask to get it here. So either use static cast or use re, uh, um, uh, dynamic cast if there is a need. Don't use C style casting. For example, this one is very dangerous and, and bug prone and, and wrong, just wrong. It's, it's clear that it's wrong. But you do see such things in. in okay. I have a question. Is there a way to forward declare a derived class without actually including it? Okay, you say, can we actually implement the method, not just declare it, implement the method? No, 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 no. I mean, exactly to get this to work with, uh, you know, just uh, without a cast. Because I want to, okay, I'm still say, using the, the concept. I, I see. Can we call through and send D? Can we call through and send D? No, I You're think. Not send a const, const D reference. I mean, it's yeah, fine yeah. because I just want to declare I'm still not using, I can, I'm fine with the incomplete type. I still only want the pointer, so I don't need to know to, to include the actual header. But I, I need to tell the compiler that D is derived from base. And that's, oh. I don't know how to forward declare a, a class that's derived from another class. I don't know of, of such a syntax of saying I'm um, incomplete type, I can, but I can tell you that I'm derived from something else, and, and that's not enough. I'm derived, and this is my first base, or I'm derived, and these are my bases, because being derived from something is not enough in order to calculate the correct pointer. You have to know which are your all your bases. So I, I don't know of any kind of trick that would allow that, either include the actual type, so the compiler knows it, or you know, put here the declaration and implement it in the CPP. Properly. Because you could think so if you want a compilation firewall, for example, different platforms to implementing the same 
interface, then this is exactly the kind of problem you come against because you don't want to include, you want only the APIs, but you need to notify everything about the, the, the interface. So one, one solution uh, that I'm just riffing here, but uh, one thing that might work, you could define a function that gets derived const reference and returns uh, the base const reference. And in the yeah, implementation yeah. file, yeah. Uh, use the, ask the compiler to do the, uh, to do the casting. Yeah. So you do the casting in a, in a different translation unit and uh, you can use the API. Nice. But that, that's a better solution. That's a better solution. That's nice. So you have the signature of the function that says, yeah, I'm returning back the proper it's pointer or reference, but it would be compiled when you have the actual type information. That's good. And, and then at the actual um, other compilation unit, you would use either static cast or uh, dynamic cast. That's good. OK. Um, so let's go for the next one. What's wrong here? We are using in meters and saying that meters is a double. And then we're using meters to hold distance. And now we are calling do something with the distance. What can go wrong here? Either measurement units can get wrong or casting from double to int or double to float. Or maybe there is no type enforcement or maybe all the above. Anyways, what you think? Most of you are saying all the above, and that's correct. We have here several problems that relate to bad typing. Measurement units can get wrong because we do not enforce anything. We can give here seven and a half that we thought is kilometers. Nothing is actually checked here. It's not strong typing. And there might be casting from in double to in or any, any casting that we do, narrow casting that we do not want. So there's no type inform, enforcement all the above. Uh, what should we actually do? Here is, for example, a, a problem. Do something might go get float, which says distance in feet. And I didn't know that. I, I didn't go to read the name of the parameter and nothing is being checked at compile time. Or it might get int as centimeters. Uh, the, the, the satellite here is related to this actual problem. Um, so the, the, the solution is to use user-defined literals and actual safe types, strong types, either uh, through named type from Joe Bukara or other libraries. Um, using a struct as a strong type is not actually a strong type. It's better than nothing. But then you can still send 10 and 12 as meters, even though you wanted another thing. So 10 is going to the struct and, and creating meters, and you have your implicit casting. In order to avoid the implicit casting, in order to enforce the need to say actually the measurement units that you're using, the actual type that you are sending, you want to avoid implicit casting. So you can do that either by, by implementing a real struct with, with a constructor, so it will be a class, or by going through um, solutions like named type already being implemented out there. Uh, there are um, many, um, many blogs about this problem and, and, and satellites and, and uh, um, missiles uh, uh, do crash about because of that. And there are many safe type options, uh, many unit libraries, et cetera. For physics, for um, um, distance and so on. Uh, the next one, what's wrong with this piece of code? We have here a foo, and we send zero to foo, and it is said that foo with zero should return max in. So we know, we know it is being told that when you call foo with zero, you would get back max in. Okay, we got max in. And then we do other things. So what, what will be printed? This is the question. What the program would print? Either x is smaller, this one, or y is smaller or equal, or it can print anything, or code doesn't compile. Please cast your vote. And here it is. Most of you are saying C. And indeed, it can print anything because we have here undefined behavior. And what is the undefined behavior? Uh, we overflow. We overflow. 
and overflowing on a signed integer is undefined. Uh, so the compiler can either assume anything here or can actually check at runtime. Or you can say, well, I, I see that y is x plus 1, so it, it must say the y, that y is bigger than x. So the compiler can just see that. And, and indeed, when I run it with different compilers, I get different results. And if I run it with a dynamic, um, um, how it is called, a dynamic uh, analysis tool, uh, I get that there is an undefined behavior there. OK. So don't do that. Signed integer overflow is undefined. Uh, and, and you do see things like that. You do see, for example, that people calculate average by summing up a lot of integers and then dividing them by the count. Well, it would not work. You would actually have overflow if you, if you have enough ints or doubles. You cannot just sum up many integers, every result, and then calculate it by the count to get the average. You would probably go through overflow, if not in testing, in production. Uh, many talks about that. Uh, many uh, uh, posts in Stack Overflow um, um, talks in uh, CPP cone. Uh, undefined behavior is a, um, a very popular talk, a very popular subject in CPP cone. Here are uh, several, several links to such uh, talks. So let's go to the next one. Um, we don't have much more left. So please bear with me and, and, and try to get points. What's wrong with this one? We have a stack. And uh, we implement the stack by using a vector inside the stack. So when someone is calling push and sending t, we push back, calling st forward, the t that we got. And the answers are a t double ref in push is not a falling reference, thus compilation error. Or t double ref in push is not a falling reference, thus we support only push of our values. Or push may, be, may add to the vector a dangling reference. Or the last one, push may inefficiently copy when it can move an item into the vector. Please cast your vote. What's wrong with this push function? There is something wrong, wrong with this push. Does it compile? Well, A says it does not compile. The other options say, well, it does, but there is some kind of a problem. Let's give you five more seconds. And let's share the results. Well, most of you are saying B. And B is saying that T double ref here is not a falling reference. And that's correct, because T is not a template parameter. T was being resolved once we know that we are stuck of T. It's not a template parameter of myself. It was being resolved already for being a uh, um, falling reference. I have to be a template parameter without any addition, without being const, without being resolved already above. So it is not a falling reference, which means it is our value. So if it is our value, it means that we do not support L value. Now, that's the default would work in this case, but, but well, we do not support L value. You, you would have choose here maybe better STD move, but better even uh, even better is to support both. How can you support both? By having two push methods, one for R value and the other one for const L value. Or if you want, you can implement one using folding reference, asking the folding reference to be convertible to T if you want to restrict it. And then this one is actually a forwarding reference that you can use, and it actually accepts both R value and L value. This one is fine. OK, let's go to the next function in stack, same stack. But now pop. Pop function wants to pop a value from the stack. How do we pop? Uh, we will call back on the vector. We'll get back the element from the vector. Then we will pop back the item in order to remove it from the vector and return it back. By the way, do we need the std move, the std move? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Well, we'll discuss it. Uh, and the answers are A, pop returns a dangling reference, or B, pop moves from a dangling reference. Code would be okay without the code to std move. This is what B says. Remove the std move. 
C says pop has undefined behavior because moving out from a vector is impossible. You cannot move out of a vector. And D says that the reference E is being invalidated once we call pop back. So E is okay, E is not okay. You are holding E, now you're holding an invalidated reference. What's your answer? Please cast your vote. There is a problem with pop here. What is the problem? Can we fix it? Can we fix it by removing the stood move, maybe? Then it is B. Uh, maybe we cannot move out of a vector, then it is C. Okay, let's give you five more seconds. Three more seconds. Let's reveal your answers. Okay, uh, most of you are saying D. And indeed, D is the answer. And why D? Because when you pop back, then inside the pop back, there is a destructor call. The vector is calling the destructor of the actual element that, set, that, that is sitting here. By the way, it is calling the destructor without calling delete. It is just calling directly the destructor because we do not want to, to free any allocation. The allocation is there. This is, by the way, why, why it is an invalidated reference and not a dangling reference. Uh, semantics. You cannot use this reference because it refer to something that was destroyed. The memory is there, but well, it was destroyed. So, so moving it out, no, uh, you are moving out a dead object. Don't do that. Do we need the stood move if it was okay? Well, if it was okay, and it is not, you can you cannot. The pop back is killing the the reference e. But if it was okay, yeah, you do need stood move when you return something which is not a local variable. Returning a local variable doesn't need a stud move because returning a local variable is an expiring value which behaves as an R value. But returning something which here, in this case, is an L value, if you actually want to move it out, well, here not, here this is a bad. But if you actually want to move out something which is not a local variable, then yes, you need std move. So stood move on the return is not necessarily a wrong thing. In some cases, not here. In some cases, it is required. Suppose that you want to move out a member. And again, the member is now invalidated. And you know that it's fine. You want to do that. Yes, in some cases, you do need to call stood move on the return because you are not returning a local variable. So what is the proper way? The proper way would be to implement pop that moves the back takes the back and moves it into E. So this line is not calling the copy constructor, it calls the move constructor. And then we moved from the vector. We just stole from the vector. And then we invalidate. We just say, okay, call it destructor. And, and we are fine because you, we are calling a destructor of something that the move constructor already handled it's okay, you probably are calling a destructor on a moved object, that's fine, move handles that here. And then you return E, and here you do not need to call std move because it would be moved. Why? It is a local variable. So this is the efficient way of doing that, and we do move. Actually, you mustn't out. call move because you might uh, get a lesion and move with uh, with That's correct. Like if you're that. calling std move, you may be less efficient because the optimizer might not use copy elision. Uh, and then you would go through move. And here, uh, most probably RVO um, would uh, eliminate, would, would elide the need for uh, move. So yeah, you should not use std move when there is no need uh, because here, you are moving, or if the optimizer and here the optimizer can probably uh, the compiler sees in C plus plus seventeen it would be a mandatory optimization. It sees that the actual value I think can be constructed on the return value. Okay, uh, what's the problem here? We have here a conditional assign a method that gets a condition and two references to A. The first one, A1, is a reference, not a const one. And the second is a const reference to A. Why the second one is const? Because we want to assign A2 into A1. A1 is going to be assigned into, and A2 uh, would be assigned to. So this one is const. We just read from it. This one is not. We write to it. And we want to do it only if the condition is true. So we say, if condition, so please do the assignment. Now, we have a B. 
and we call conditional assign with a B. What's the problem? Well, A says, well, you have your potential wrong method call. You are not calling the method that you think you are calling, or you have a potential dangling reference, or a potential self-assignment, or a potential infinite recursion. What do you think is the answer? Please cast your vote. Something is wrong, but it's a bit hiding there. Let's reveal the results. Whoa, it's a tie. Nobody thinks D. Nobody sees here an infinite recursion. And indeed, there is no recursion here, but there is a potential wrong method call. And what is the potential wrong method call? When, when, well, usually, well, we would start with a default assignment. The default assignment is not virtual. And usually your assignment, if you implemented one, is also, not, is also no, not, not virtual. So when you, when you call here the assignment, you are calling the assignment of A. So it's a bit of a slicing. You are assigning A to an A, even if B got inside. Whoa, 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 whoa. I, I only assigned part of the object, the A part of it, because I didn't call the proper assignment because the assignment is not virtual in most cases. So be aware, default assignment is not virtual. Probably your assignment is not virtual. So, you know, if you see assignment, well, Usually it will not work polymorphically. Take care of that. Beware of object slicing in general. We will not talk about object slicing. Unique PTR deleter also is going through some kind of a slicing. There was a talk by me in some old uh, back then uh, called CPP meetup. Next one, almost the last one. We have 20 questions. This is one before the last. What's wrong here? And the answers are A, potential memory leak or inefficient design or a potential infinite recursion or code doesn't compile. What do you say? Let's reveal the results. Okay, most of you are saying A. Most of you are saying here a potential memory leak, but I do see other answers. Uh, and indeed there is a potential memory leak here. Why? Because once A is holding B and B is holding back A, which is the current design, if nobody holds A or B, suppose that we have an instance of A and an instance of B, each one is holding the other one, no one holds them. They will just stay alive forever. Why? Because the shell PTR is not decreased to zero. We have a slight cyclic shell PTR reference. So what is the proper or one of the proper solutions for that? Well, one of the solutions is to use weak PTR on one side. One side is the owner, the other side says, okay, I may reach you, but it might be that I cannot reach you because you are already dead. I'm allowing you to die. I'm not keeping you alive. And then the cyclic dependency breaks. This is a very classic solution for that. Let's go for the last one. Are you ready? Last, last chance to get points. Okay, what's wrong here? We have a function. The function is getting a const Godzilla by ref. We have in the main a Godzilla, and we call a thread with function. We, we run the function in a separate thread. We spawn a thread, and we send G, the Godzilla, into the thread. And the problem is here. Look at the problem. Look at this line. The problem hides here. What is the problem? We have here a potentially memory leak, a potential memory leak, or a redundant copying. Or maybe we have here some problem with creating an unjoinable thread. Or maybe thread is not copyable. And thus, there is some kind of a problem. What's wrong with this code? Most of you are saying B. Most of you are seeing here a redundant copy. Is this the correct answer? Or do I think the same? Well, yes, there is here a redundant copying. Why? Because we think that we pass G as a ref, but we do not. When passing parameters to thread, they go to a decay, through a decay, and then the problem is that G is actually being, being copied. The correct way is to use 2C ref if we want to keep it as a const reference, and then we actually pass a reference. If it was, if it was not const here, without the const here, the compiler would have helped us, would help by 
uh, issuing a compilation error because you cannot copy into an L value, but you cannot you can copy into a const L value. Well, we had several um, scenarios like that in in this talk. So you can copy into const ref, and that's what's going here. And it might be that Godzilla is is quite big, or you want to look at the actual Godzilla, which might be changing. Uh, maybe you lock inside and and you need the actual same Godzilla. No, you got a copy. Do you want a copy? Maybe not. So pass a C ref. Let's go through the score summary. Um, you can now count your scores. Maybe you already counted it uh, while answering the questions. And if you got 18 to 20 points, there were 20 questions, so, so you were quite good. So you probably wrote so many bugs, which make you the real simple as throw you are. Ask for a raise, you deserve it. And email me to kyoshami at gmail.com to ask for the prize. A draw might be conducted if there are too many winners, but yeah, you deserve it. And in the email, write me your um, address, your post address, so we can send you the incredible T-shirt. If you got 12 to 17 points, that's still good. Remember, uh, Bjorn itself rates 7 out of 10. He rates himself 7 out of 10 in C++. Yes, he, he did say it. And, and yeah, write to me as well. Yeah, you are good. Uh, well, six, to, six to, to 11 points, if you are on 6 to 11 points, you are a bit rusty. Consider moving to rust. And if you um, on zero to five points, don't feel too bad, but be sure to get your code reviewed, especially if you are working on life critical systems. Thank you all. <laughs>